In this video, we're going to do a second example problem where we need to use both momentum concepts and energy concepts to solve the problem. We're going to be using this handout to guide us through the process so that we use each of those concepts, momentum and energy, when it is appropriate, and also keep our work organized as we are doing so. So let's look at the problem. In this problem, we have a string here. And at the end of the string, we have a wood block. At the moment, that wood block is just resting there. But we have a ball that's going to come in from the left, moving rightward. It's going to strike the wood block and then rebound to the left. Now, because of the collision, that wood block is going to begin to swing upward at the end of its string. And we want to know, as that wood block swings upward, what is the maximum angle between the vertical direction and the string? We are given the mass of the ball and the mass of the wood block. The ball has mass 100 grams. The block has mass 500 grams. The length of the string that goes from the ceiling to the wood block is one meter. And and the ball is coming in, moving rightward at eight meters per second. So let's have a look at the handout. So step 1A is to draw a diagram illustrating each situation of interest. Anytime we have a collision, we draw one moment of interest right before the collision and one moment of interest right after the collision. So this picture illustrates right before the collision. Let's call that moment of interest A. Let's put in another figure to represent what's going on right after the collision. Right after the collision, we are told that mass one has rebounded. So by that, I mean mass one is now moving to the left. Let's call this situation B. So we'll say that the velocity of mass one here would be V1B. But because mass two just took a hit, mass two is going to be moving to the right. So let's call the velocity of mass two in this situation V2B. What happens after this is mass two is going to swing upward at the end of its string. So let's go to a third moment of interest where mass two has reached its greatest height just before it begins to come back down. We will call this moment C. Let's say that when mass two is at the maximum height, the string makes angle theta with the vertical. And I'll just put in for clarity that in this situation, the velocity of mass two is zero. Now we have our moments of interest. So coming back to the handout, we have labeled the situations A, B, C. One C here, we want to indicate the zero level for gravitational potential energy. Now it's actually pretty common in this type of problem to put the zero level down here at the bottom of the swing for mass two. My preference is actually to put the zero level here at the support point for the string. What this means is that the gravitational potential energy for mass two will always be negative, but in situation B, the gravitational potential energy will be more negative, and then here in situation C, it will be less negative. Okay, step D, introduce a coordinate system. So if we look at the collision between A and B, we're going to need a coordinate system to keep track of which velocities are positive and which are negative. So I'm just gonna say we have a plus X direction pointing to the right. That's our coordinate system. Okay, so step E, is we go from each situation to the next and figure out which physical law applies. Okay, so on the top of a handout here, I have the list of the different physical principles we might be using and when each one of those applies. So let's go from situation A to situation B. We know that between situation A and situation B, there is a collision between the two masses. Now, when we have a collision between two masses, then most of the time, that's going to mean that non-conservative forces are acting between the two masses. 
If non-conservative forces are acting, then we cannot use conservation of mechanical energy here. On the other hand, on the other hand, during a collision, we don't even know exactly how to describe those non-conservative forces, which means that we don't know exactly how much work was done by the non-conservative forces, which means that this last equation doesn't help us very much either. So what does that leave? It leaves conservation of momentum. Conservation of momentum applies when you have a system of objects and the forces the objects exert on each other are so great that we can neglect the effects of outside forces. So between A and B, we're going to assume that the forces the objects exert on each other are so great that we can neglect the effects of outside forces and apply conservation of momentum. So going from moment A to moment B, you will use conservation of momentum. In other words, total momentum in situation A equals total momentum in situation B. Now, what about the B to C step? As we go from B to C, mass one is no longer a player. Mass one did its job by colliding into mass two. Now it's moving away. So as we go from situation B to situation C, what we're interested in really is just mass two. Can we apply conservation of momentum just to mass two? Well, as we go from B to C, are there any other forces acting on mass two? Well, we have the tension in the string and we have the gravitational force, of course. So conservation of momentum is out. Now, when we go from B to C, can we use conservation of mechanical energy? Now, as mass two goes through this motion, the forces acting are the gravitational force and the tension force from the string. The gravitational force is conservative and the tension force is actually a non-conservative force, but do we actually have to worry about that here? In this problem, we don't actually have to worry about that tension force being non-conservative, and here's the reason. So I'm gonna act this out, and we're just gonna say that this piece of chocolate here is mass two, and the red pen there, that will be the string, and I'm gonna use the blue pen here to represent the velocity vector of mass two. Now, do you see here that as mass two swings upward, the velocity vector of mass two is always going to be perpendicular to the tension in the string. So in this case, even though the tension force is non-conservative, it's always perpendicular to the motion of the object. And since the tension force is always perpendicular to the motion of the object, it does no work, now, because the tension force therefore does no work, look at this last equation here. The work done by non-conservative forces is then still zero. And that brings us back to our equation for conservation of mechanical energy. So it is true in this situation that we do in fact have a non-conservative force acting, but because it does no work, we can ignore that and just go back to our equation for conservation of mechanical energy. Okay, so for the B to C step, we're going to use conservation of mechanical energy. So we can write that as change in kinetic energy plus, okay, no springs in this problem. So it's just change in kinetic energy plus change in gravitational potential energy equals zero. So now we go to step two. So step two says for each transition from one situation of interest to the next, write down the correct equation relating the two. So we already did that. So now we have worked out the correct conservation principle to use from A to B and the correct conservation principle to use from B to C. Here's what we're going to do now. In the A to B step, we're going to use conservation of momentum to figure out the velocity of mass 2 immediately after the collision. Once we get the velocity of mass 2 immediately after the collision, we're going to go to the B to C step and in the B to C step, we can then use conservation of mechanical energy to find out the final angle between the string and the vertical. So let's start working on the A to B step. We have total momentum in A equals total momentum in B. That means we need an expression for the total momentum in A and an expression for the total momentum in B. So maybe try this on your own here. Write down an expression for the total momentum in A 
an expression for the total momentum in B, equate those to each other, and see if you can then get the velocity of mass two immediately after the collision, and then rejoin the video. Okay, total momentum in situation A, only mass one is moving, so I have M1 V1 A. Total momentum in situation B, both masses are moving, so I have M1 V1 B plus M2 V2 B. So now I equate those, total momentum A equals total momentum B. So M1 V1 A equals M1 V1 B plus M2 V2 B. We're going to solve for V2B. We take M1 V1 B, move it to the left where it picks up a minus sign. And then I'm also going to divide through by M2 there. And I'm going to switch sides and pull out the M1. So I have V2B equals M1 times quantity V1A minus V1B all over M2. M1, 100 grams, V1A minus V1B. I have V1A, 8 meters per second. And then minus V1B. Now, V1B, I put in as minus 3 meters per second because it is given that it rebounds at 3 meters per second by rebound. I understand that to mean mass one is moving to the left, in other words, in the negative direction. And divide by mass two, which is 500 grams. And I get V2B equals 2.20 meters per second. Notice that the grams uh, canceled. Okay, so I'm going to come back here and put in V2B equals 2.20 meters per second. So now let's proceed to the B to C step. In the B to C step, we have change in kinetic energy plus change in gravitational potential energy equals zero. So for the B step, we need kinetic energy B and gravitational potential energy B. For the C step, we need kinetic energy C and gravitational potential energy C. So why don't you pause the video, fill these in as well as you can, maybe even go all the way to the answer to try to find this angle, and then rejoin the video. In situation B, the only thing we have moving here is mass 2. Remember, we are ignoring mass 1 at that point, so the kinetic energy is 1 half mass 2 V2B squared. Now, as far as the gravitational potential energy, remember that I put the zero level up here. That means that mass 2 starts out a distance L beneath the zero level. So gravitational potential energy, uh, I'll put in the usual formula here, which would be M2GH. But we're taking H here to be minus L. Okay, kinetic energy in part C would be zero because this has stopped moving. Now, gravitational potential energy in C. So now we have to figure out how far beneath the zero level is mass two in situation C. Now, we're interested in the vertical distance beneath the zero level. So the relevant distance would be this distance here. Okay, uh, the string here will be our hypotenuse for the right triangle. The string has length L. Now, this side of the right triangle that we're looking for is adjacent to the theta. So if the hypotenuse is L, the adjacent side would be L cosine theta. So in the final situation, mass two is the distance L cosine theta beneath the zero level 
So I'm going to put that as M2G, and then the H becomes minus L cosine theta. Okay, let's put this into conservation of mechanical energy. Since we're going from B to C, change in kinetic energy would be kinetic energy C minus kinetic energy B. That would be the same for gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy C minus gravitational potential energy B equals zero. All right, kinetic energy C is zero. Substituting everything else, we have then minus one half M2 V2B squared and gravitational potential C It would be this, minus M2GL cosine theta. And then we have minus gravitational potential B, which in itself is minus M2GL. So notice we are subtracting a negative here, but that's okay. It will just turn into a plus sign. All of that equals zero. As we go to the next line, notice that all of these terms have a mass two, so we can divide through by mass two, get rid of that. And moving to the next line, minus V2B squared over two. These two terms here and here have a GL, so I'm gonna pull out the GL as a common factor, and that's multiplied by minus cosine theta plus one equals zero. And now we can just go ahead, do our algebra to isolate the theta. And I'm going to start by taking that minus V2B squared over two term, moving it to the right where it picks up a plus sign, and then also divide by GL. So that's going to give me minus cosine theta plus one equals V2B squared over two GL. Okay, now I'm going to take that one, move it to the other side. Now when that one moves to the other side, it's going to pick up a minus sign, but then I'm going to multiply through by minus one. So all of those terms are going to have their signs changed. I have cosine theta equals minus V two B squared over two G L plus one, right? So remember I moved the one over to here, became a minus one, and then multiplied the whole thing through by minus one, while well, the signs flipped. So I'm going to take the inverse cosine of both sides. So I have theta equals inverse cosine of one minus V2B squared over two GL. All right, let's do our substitutions now. And the argument of an inverse cosine should be unitless. Now, one clearly is unitless. We want to make sure this is unitless as well. So I have one minus a V2B we got. It was 2.20 meters per second at squared, then divide by two, G, 9.8 meters per second squared, L, one meter. Okay. Notice that in the numerator, meters squared over second squared, and the denominator is meters squared over second squared as well, and I get here 41.1 degrees. So coming back to the figure here, mass two swings upward, and at the greatest height of mass two, the angle between the string and the vertical is 41.1 degrees. And now we have done a second example problem involving both momentum conservation and mechanical energy concepts.